Since the Taliban took control of Afghanistan on Sunday, August 15th, 2021, there have been concerns about the rights of women and children in the country that is now called the Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan. Now, despite press conferences held by the Taliban, uh, basically assuring citizens that the rights of women will be respected, uh, Brookings Institute's researchers, analysts and experts say that they doubt that that's a likelihood. Um, to speak more on this and on the rule of the Taliban in Afghanistan, let's invite Mr. Danny Kerry. He's a lecturer of philosophy at the University of Lagos. Good morning, Mr. Kerry. Good morning. Um, I want to get your assessment of the you know, general overview of the you know, takeover of the Taliban in Afghanistan and then delving straight into what your rule might likely look like. Well, th thank you for that, for having me. Now, we do know that uh, the Taliban have always constituted a, a serious threat, you know, to the government of Afghanistan. And in fact, uh, not just Afghanistan, the, the, the entire region has been under serious threat. Unfortunately, this time around, they've been able to take over the government of, of Afghanistan. Yes, but we, we, when you look at their modus operandi and all that they have done in time past, the question you will ask is, how assured are you that these people can actually guarantee the freedom, the security, the protection of the lives of the people? You know, so in this particular instance that they are now in charge of government, although the EU has said, even though they are not a legitimate government, they will be, they will, they don't have a choice but to deal with them. Now, to what extent is an issue? So I have a, a, my fears looking at both the way in which they took over government and the operation in time past, whether of, 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 of the, or, you know, they can actually guarantee the liberty the liberty of the people, particularly the issue of women and children. You know, I, I have my fears about it because uh, in the first instance, they are not a law, you know, established institution now, a law established government. So how are we sure that they are actually going to abide by the laws of the land? If they were so law abiding, how come they, they, they change the way the president? You know, so th these are some of the issues one will look at in terms of trying to access the their pledge that they are going to protect, you know, everybody, particularly women and children. It gives me a lot of concern, as a matter of fact. So, so your so what you're saying is we uh, the world shouldn't take uh, their message uh, seriously because they've put in out fact, a message saying it, that they will it, respect, you know, these rights and and the likes. But you know, it doesn't seem very likely from what you're saying. It, in my own view, I don't, I don't think it's something that we can go to bed with. Okay. I don't think so. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Ekere, we know that um, from 1996 to 2001, when the Taliban ruled Afghanistan, they were very strict in how they regarded and treated women. They closed girls' school, they banned women from working, and even for the men, men who had short beards were penalized. And even though they're now saying that they're going to make sure that, you know, they obey women's rights, we're seeing a story here that what the Taliban is doing is that they're going door to door to find people who are seemingly against them and are working for the U.S. and NATO. What really might, might we see in the coming days in, Af in Afghanistan? Thank you. That, that again establishes or confirms my fears. Because if there are people who are going to be loved by the who are concerned about the liberty of people, they will not even engage in that search or try to deal with those that they claim or they feel would have been, uh, might have been in support of the U.S. over the years. And looking at the activities in the past, the strictness, the toughness with which they descend on people and the rest of it, it establishes that same fact as well. So my, 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 my worry now is that yeah, even if they claim to protect the rights, the liberty of men, women, and children, it's, the question you will ask is, on what background? On the laws they are going to give that will be so stern, so tough, that will, the law on its own that is going to take away your liberty? Is it on democratic principles? Is it on the rule of law? And if it's the rule of law, what law? 
You know, the, so the, these are the questions that we arise as a result. Because once they give those kind of strict laws, for instance, you want to go for go and deal with people who don't have long beards, you want to deal with people who have this, who have that, which already conflict with their liberties, it gives a lot of fear. So mm. I, I think that the, the whole world, particularly the United Nations, should watch that carefully and see how they can actually deal with this situation, that the rights of people, that their liberties is actually guaranteed. Mm. Now that you've brought in the UN into this, um, we know that on Tuesday, German Chancellor Angela Merkel um, put out a statement asking and urging other European countries to accept um, refugees from Afghanistan. But with the perception of the country, you know, do you, do you see, you know, other European countries opening their doors and opening their arms for refugees from Afghanistan? I, I want to think that they will comply or cooperate because the EU has already issued a statement that despite the fact that they recognize that this is not the legitimately elected government of Afghan, they still re they are going to deal with them. So how they are going to deal with them is what we are yet to know. But if it is anything to go by, it means that they must have to as well cooperate in a manner that the refugees are taken care of. Because without that, how, are, how else are you going to deal with them? Is it by way of, is, after all, it's not, a go, it's, not going, it's not going to be by fights. And already the situation has created a refugee scenario. So one way of dealing with them is to ensure that you first, you accept these refugees, go into whatever negotiation you are going to make, in order that there will be a, a situation that will be bearable mm -hmm. for the people. As for the Taliban's, they are, they are already a group of people who are addicted to a particular lifestyle. And for them, that lifestyle is the best, you right. know? So, so I wanna... for those who are not, those who are not, who do not key into their philosophy, are the ones who are going to have the challenge. And that is what is creating the refugee situation. If they are so assured that these people can guarantee their liberties and their uh, uh, rights, do you think people will be fleeing away? So these hmm. are the challenges, really. All right, Mr. Akira, let's also talk about the origination of or where this type of philosophy came from. Um, there currently are rallies in um, Afghanistan. Some of the Afghan people are protesting against, you know, the Taliban already, and that was in the news yesterday. Yeah. Um, but can you share with us, you know, the origin of this type of uh, philosophy that the Taliban has? It's, it's, you know, a lot of people would argue that this isn't pure Islam and this isn't what the, the Quran teaches. And so how is it so powerful that it has been able to, you know, give birth to the ta Taliban? And of course, um, you know, what we're currently seeing in Afghanistan. Thank you. Now, now. The, the origin will be very difficult to say it is this point or that point. But then look at, look at a few things that have been taking place over time. You will recall that crime, in a way, is one thing that attracts people when they are jobless. Hmm. Now, again, when you find religious doctrines that are being marketed or sold to people, that people key to with some kind of persuasions, Religion is one thing that operates by faith that once you, once you hold on to it, you don't use logic to handle it. And the moment you key into a religious faith, the tendency is that every other value will come under it. Now, these people have been able to market a particular style of religion. The word Islam will be made to understand it uh, means peace. So I don't know how peace becomes fight. So you will find out that this. Oh, sadly, we lost Mr. Ikeri there. But uh, to bring you up to speed, we've been talking about the Taliban rule in Afghanistan and how it's likely to be in the coming days, coming weeks, months. And only God knows if you know this would be able to um, basically be addressed before it spirals out of control. But I want us to take a look about, at about five key promises the Taliban has made to the Afghan people and to the world. Now, they've mentioned that um, the rights of women will be respected, but they put the caveat, they said it's going to be within the um, confines of Sharia law. 
but we know that people have expressed fears that that might not work. Mr. Ikebra, we have you back. Welcome. Yes, yes, thank yes. you. I was trying to draw, you know, a, a background. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and that, you know, faith itself, the way it works, okay. it is so that every other thing comes under it. Faith can separate a family hmm. more than anything else. So now, the, the, the one of the Taliban, if the word Islam means peace, and they are telling you that they are Muslim, uh, Islam, uh, members of Islam, it shows that they are the extremist group. And once you go into extremism, obviously you are creating a new set of values. Hmm. And when you look at the way discipline is enforced by some of these uh, you know, religious beliefs, you will begin to wonder whether there could be any sense of humanism in the practice. You know, so for the for the Taliban, they've been able, you know, to impress themselves on a set of people who perhaps at a point, I doubt they were politically, the, maybe even the displaced or economically disadvantaged. And along the line, they were able to make some provisions to cater for them. And they have now, just like what you have in Boko Haram, there are people who are still being recruited into it, despite the fact that what they are after is you know bringing mayhem upon on people hmm. so in, in such cases even boko haram offer people money we'll see videos yes, where we'll people are recruited into boko haram and they are telling you they don't even know what they are going there for so somehow these people make some provision for their people and such people believe that this is the savior hmm. along the line they establish themselves in such a way that they are so enmeshed in all the vices even in their own particular beliefs, to the extent that when they unleash that on the general public, they believe that that should be the standard of life. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Mr. So that's the real challenge we're having. Mr. Kerry, I, I've, you know, listened to, um, you know, sadly, I think I shared this yesterday, I listened to a couple of um, podcasts where people were detailing their fears, you know, people who are currently still in Afghanistan. Who Including journalists. Out including yeah. journalists who had assisted yeah. the United States and, you know, assisted uh, the West um, yeah. all the while that uh, they were still present there. And so that's a very, very strong fear if those people yes. would survive. There's a person who also was interviewed who said that uh, nobody should take um, the word of the Taliban seriously because they will find these people and they will behead them, according to him. Um, but I, I want you to share your thoughts on if the Afghan people can take back their country. Is, is there that any possibility in that, seeing how the Afghan army almost fled. basically fled and surrendered. Can the Afghan people still take back their country? Well, even the, the Taliban, they, they, are, they are part of Afghanistan. They are, some of them are from the country, you know. So they are still part of the country. So to say whether the Afghan people can take back their country, they are the ones in charge, except that they are not the legitimate ones that were given the, the power and authority to govern the state. You know, so for the others who will be looking forward to reinstalling or reinstating the kind of order they used to have, it's going to be a very tall order. That will mean that the rest of the world will have to come to their rescue. Hmm. You know, because if you continue with the, with the line of action they have taken already, they are prepared for anything. So, Mr. Ikeri, um, what we saw in 1996 to 2001 was U.S. You know, takeover, U.S. invasion, you know, the U.S. occupation, actually, of yeah. Afghanistan. Now, they yes. pulled out, the Taliban took over again. Now, yeah. if we're looking at a situation where world powers come together, Russia, China, because right now I don't see the U.S., any possibility of the U.S. going back into Afghanistan from the body language and actually the words of, of Joe Biden. He actually said there was no right time to pull out of Afghanistan and, you know, they're living with the consequences. So other countries coming together um, to intervene in Afghanistan, do you see that as a possibility? Because we saw what happened when the U.S. stepped in and when they pulled out. So do you think countries who decide to... I don't know, let the country deal with it themselves because maybe they go into the country, they occupy there for a while, and then they come back and the Taliban comes back stronger. Yeah, now look, at, you look at it from this angle. You now have a refugee situation. Is it Afghanistan that is now hosting the refugees? No. You see, once a problem of this kind happens to any country, it spills to the Others. neighboring co yes. communities, the neighboring countries. Practically the rest of the world suffers part of it. So if you wait for the Afghan uh, community to address this issue, then what you are saying is that 
the refugee situation should escalate, and that there, there will be, you know, a, a, a situation in which people will be in a, a kind of bondage. Hmm. So the world, the world was the essence of the United Nations, if not to address challenges of this kind. So they must find a way of coming into negotiation with these people and ensure that they restate order. But, but Mr. Ikere, we know the Taliban negotiations, amnesty. We, we, we've seen how they act when it comes to this and how nations cannot exactly hold them by their word when it comes to negotiations and peace deals. First of all, um, when we lost you there, I was basically reiterating about five promises the Taliban have made. And when I look at them, when you take a closer look, it then seems like it's promises that they that they say they would not fulfill. Because first of all, they've promised um, to grant women freedom and rights. In the con confines of Sharia law, people are afraid that that might not happen. They have said that they are going to pardon everybody who walked to the US, all their enemies. But now we're seeing that the Taliban have been going door to door looking for people who actually work with the US to attack them or imprison them or punish them. They've also said that they're going to ensure security in the embassies. We don't see any likelihood of that happening. They said that also they're going to make sure that they ban narcotics. We know how the Middle East is with drug use. You know, also they have said that um, they're not going to, there's not going to be any use of Afghan soil against other countries. So when you take a look at the promises that um, Taliban have made and, you know, what we've seen with two of those promises going south ways, do you see it as maybe these are things that they've said that they would actually do, not things that they wouldn't do? I've told you clearly that I have no confidence in the, the Taliban. In the same manner, they are, they are not ignorant of the fact that even the U.S. occupation of the, this place was equally not a, a, a genuine and sincere something. Hmm. They know that the, the West, particularly the United States, equally has a lot of you know, shady deals. So when you know that this person is, is, is not plain, and you are dealing with such a person in a plain manner, you are obviously just deceiving yourself. Mm. So they understood very clearly, too, that this is the nature of the U.S. as well. Like so her. they have to find a way to see how they can just market themselves, see how the world can embrace them and see them as who are really out for something serious. And that's why all those promises are coming out. Mm. Even some of those promises, the Sharia-based promises, they are as good as, you know, uh, bondage, some of them. Yeah. You know, because I, I, I'm not aware that Sharia permits uh, women to to become president one day. I don't know. Oh, it doesn't. Um, well, um, you, it, really funny how, you know, you, you've mentioned that, you know, they have to be accepted, you know, and that is, you know, it's a, it's a funny place to be in, you know, to know that a terrorist organization will be accepted, you know, by other countries. I'm not sure how that even sounds um, to anybody, you know, and that includes also on social media because uh, Facebook, Twitter and the likes, uh, don't seem to be, you know, uh, shutting down Taliban pages. They've allowed some of these things to thrive. But I want us to go back to the, you know, the start. You know, as far back as you remember, um, the Taliban have been growing in strength and have been thriving because of support from certain quarters, I believe. Um, they have had some type, some level of support, maybe from terrorist finan financing nations. Um, and like you also mentioned, the U.S. have some blame or some shady deals. So. Uh, Mr. Akari, who would you say should also hold a huge part of the blame for what we're seeing today? <laughs> well, well, if, if the area of blame is what you are looking for, it's going to be a very serious situation because uh, in the first instance, you know, before you begin to blame the fowl that is eating cassava, you should blame the cassava that refused to grow downward and choose to grow upward, you know? So something has created a situation for them, and that is why all of this is happening. So rather than go for blames, we should look for ways out of this lockdown. And one of such ways, like I said, is for the United Nations to do what is more proper to guarantee a situation whereby the liberties of people are protected. Yes, that is the most important thing, because if you go into the issue of blames, on both sides, obviously, you will find some levels of settled places of blames. But the most important thing is the people. How do we address the challenge the people are faced with? How do we address this issue of uh, refugees? Because at the end of the day, it's equally going to affect the issue of food, food supply. Who should be that's what you know. So we must look at this thing holistically and see how best to address it. And I'm thinking that one sure way of doing this 
obviously you will not send anybody from the United States to Afghanistan and say you want to mediate over one thing. They will not listen to you. I even don't think the United States will want to engage in that. So let it under the umbrella of the United Nations for this issue to be escalated to the point that we can't get to a resolution, an amicable resolution of the crisis. Um, finally, how do you um, expect the other parties here, you know, the silent parties, Russia and China, um, what role do you think that these other nations might play um, in this uh, conversation? We do know the kind of conflict, the kind of rivalry that, you know, if you like, call it cold blood. This time, I don't know if the blood is actually cold or hot, you know. Yeah. I, I think what should be done, as long as all the nations mentioned are part of the United, uh, United Nations, let the United Nations as a body take over this challenge and address it. Otherwise, you will still find these chemistries of, you know, several interests, the whatever, Russia and the rest of them. Yeah, because there's always this battleground of who is superior. That battle of supremacy, if we allow it to, to, to thrive, the people will always be the ones to suffer because these are like two elephants. When they fight, the grass obviously will suffer. Yeah. So let's ensure that the grass is nourished so that it doesn't suffer. Dan Akera, lecturer at Philosophy, University of Lagos. Thank you so much for your time this Friday morning. Thank you. Thank you. Great Thank you. Great Absolutely. And of course, um, best of wishes to the Afghan people um, uh, today. And uh, we hope that the, the best result um, you know, is uh, achieved here, hopefully. This is where we wrap up. You can join us on our social media platforms to catch up on any of these conversations that we've had this morning. It's simply at Plus TV Africa on Instagram and Facebook. Same with our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. I am Osao Gye. I am Aneta Felix. Bye-bye.